Hi, I'm Bart Herbison, Executive Director of the Nashville Songwriters Association, and we're privileged to have, for the second week, great songwriter-composer John Bettis with us. I guess if you want to get on an album in world <laughs> history, yeah. it's this a thriller. Uh, <laughs> right key. You know, Good for you. And I don't sing. But anyway, I mean, um, you wrote Human Nature. I did. And that's the story behind the song this week. My favorite... I think the most underrated band in modern American history is Toto. Absolutely. They all started as studio musician guys, but uh, you and Steve Porcaro, and the Porcaro brothers, Steph, Steve yeah. and Jeff, you wrote this. Yes. And uh, tell me about it. <laughs> um, well, everybody knew that everybody was in love with the Off the Wall album. Sold two and a half million, I think. And... <clears throat> It was especially important because it's hard to appreciate now, but it was a musical break breakthrough. Yeah. What Rod Temperton and Quincy were doing, and Bruce Swedeen too, sonically, rhythmically, everything else was a precursor to everything that's urban now. And everybody was excited about it. So was I. But I was busy doing other stuff. Um, and, you know, I was a big fan of Off the Wall, but I didn't think I had anything in me for Michael to say. It was just, it was okay with me. My friends could have a song on it. That's okay. I just didn't have anything to say for Michael. So, pardon me. <clears throat> um, it was all cut. I heard it was coming out in a couple of months and um, didn't know. And then I got a call one afternoon from Kathy Carey at um, Warner Brothers Music. And Kathy says, Q's looking for you. And that's Quincy. And I said, Why? And uh, I'd worked with Quincy for the last couple of years on Donna Summer and other things. And I said, what's he looking for me for? And he says, we got something for you. It's for Michael. And I said, Michael? And she said, yeah, Michael Jackson. And I said, okay. And so I hung up and waited, and he called me about an hour later. And he said, John, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing what I do every day, Quincy. I'm writing a song. You do a good Quincy. <laughs> John. <laughs> he says, man, I got this, I got this tune. I got this tune, and we really need your touch. I went, okay, here we go. Uh, what you got? And the story is that they had done at least the rough mixes, if not the real mixes, on the entire Thriller album. And all of them had taken it away to listen to it. And they'd all reached the same conclusion. They were one song shy. And they thought they needed a mid-tempo ballad. Right. They really did. And you know what? In retrospect, they were they right. They were right. Glues it. When you look at it, yes. And they knew it, all of them. And so um, they sent out some feelers to people. And at the time, you were so kind to mention, I agree with you, that the, the groundbreaking band Toto was really redefining music. The, uh, in 1980, I think it was, maybe 81, I think, they won six Grammys for that Toto album for, that had Rosanna on it in Africa. And sonically, David Page changed the, the landscape of everything. Um, it could be argued that he single-handedly brought the, he and Bill Cuomo, brought the music business back from the break. And of I extension. love the studio guys that were that great, got their <sighs> shot. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. And so, anyhow, they had called up David, who was on tour with um, Toto in Europe. And um, they'd asked David for some songs. David said, fine. And so he called up his studio tech and said, I want you to put these three songs together for Q and get them over there. So he did, but David's outfit being David's outfit. They sent it over, and um, Quincy and Rod listened through. I'm not sure Michael listened at that point. And uh, they didn't want any of those three songs. And at the end of it was, Somewhere I thought, Check me on my memory history, yeah. but there was a different demo of it that Quincy had heard, and David's at the end, was, and he didn't get it. He'd heard Human Nature before. No, I didn't know that part. Yeah, yeah, this is what he says. Quincy says it? Yes, it's, or it's, in, it's in Wiki, so I don't know if we can believe that or not. <laughs> ah, anyway, well, anyhow, but maybe it was on that same tape. It, it was. was. What happened was David had used... Yeah. A used cassette, but he and it was on there, and That's he right. didn't like what he did. But at the end, where he's doing it raw, Quincy and he's doing the dud, Quincy goes totally different opinion, and that's how you got that cut. Yeah, and it, at the end was that little snippet. Yeah. So they called me up, and they called they called Steve Picaro, who wrote the music, and he said, "Is there a lyric?" And he said, "No." 
<laughs> <laughs> and Steve was, I don't know where Steve was at the time. And, but uh, David's not a rider on the snow. No. It just happened. Although he, he tried to be at one point. Thank, it was kind of thank funny. Thank God that he didn't, the, oh. demo, the cassette didn't get oh, I'll tell you that story in a second. That was really a scary moment. But anyhow, uh, Quincy got me a cop. He got a copy of it. He listened to it all the way through because it was only the chorus that he heard. And he said, okay, I do like this. And so it needs a lyric. And Quincy was nice enough to think of my name first. Bless his heart. And so they sent me over the cassette, and I listened to it, and I went, I like that. I don't know if I can write it, but I like that. And I'm always reminded, people ask me about that. Dolly Parton, they asked her to secret a show business once, and she said, stay ready. <laughs> right? And that was the best stay ready moment, because I wrote every day for 18 years before I got to the day I wrote that song. And I mean every day. Seven of them. And so when I had to write that lyric, I was just ready to do it. It wasn't really a stress. So I just wrote all the way until I got to that line in the second verse. I was sitting in my den writing it, and I, I got to, if this town is just an apple, let me take a bite. And I really did. I just closed the book, and I walked up to my office, and I went, okay, well, I'm going to be able to write today. I'm going to be able to write today. And so I finished it by 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. And I forget how I told everybody I had it, because it was long before the days of any way you could tell anybody, but I told somebody. And they said, well, Steve's flown, flown in today. He'll meet you tomorrow at noon. And so I got over there, and Steve stumbled in about two. And um, I showed him the lyric, because back then you had, I'd print it out on an on a electric typewriter. And uh, he liked it, but he said, where's the third verse in the bridge? And I said, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the what? So Michael's got to have time to dance. <laughs> that's exactly right. So uh, I quickly wrote a third verse and quickly wrote, uh, I didn't write the bridge because, ah, little girl was as good as that was going to get. And uh, then we took it to the studio. And there's a lot to say about that session, but you mentioned David, so I'll fill in that okay. blank. We took it in and nobody was there yet. And Steve and I were in this part of the studio. And there was a grand piano and David is a killer player. I mean, he's just a joy to be around. And so we sat down, and so David goes, Hey, what do you got? What are you bringing in? So Steve played him, and he said, Oh, that one, I remember that one. So he started playing it, and we sang him the lyric, and David said, Well, no, I don't think I like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Why don't you change this and change that? And Steve and I, of course, were terrified, because we both respected David so much. But luckily, Quincy and Michael didn't agree. And they cut it literally that night, and I went home about midnight. They were about halfway through it. And the next day, it was done. It was that quick. It was 48 hours. And the cassette? We're going to go back to that story? Yeah. Well, the cassette, the, what he heard was, David had put three full songs on a used cassette. And when they got to the end, it just kept running. And it, in the faint image of that song was on there. Because they didn't mix it, so that was up the same mm, level right. as his. So it was, ah, ah, tell him that it's you. Ah, ah. And Quincy went, it goes to show you, if you've got great ears, yeah, you can hear yeah. anything. Well, um, I also think it was important, not just because they needed that song, they needed it in the show. When he did all that Thriller stuff, it was sort of like, it just weaved it, it from here to here, and it was a transition back up to there. But I want to read about, about Dotcom's Bill Lamb. Oh, Look back on the track 25 years after its release and grab the guitar. He felt that the song, quote unquote, set down a blueprint for what become well, what would become known as adult rhythm and blues. Oof, and really? I agree with it. Yeah, that's Bill's quote. So, the story behind the song this week, John Bettis, Human Nature. Looking out across the nighttime, the city winks a sleepless eye. Hear her voice shake my window, sweet seducing sighs. Get me out into the nighttime, for walls won't hold me tonight. If this town is just an apple, let me take a bite. If they say why, why, 
I tell them that it's human nature. Why? Why does it do me that way?